Uh, so subjects who were promised 10 euros in one week had to be paid uh, 3 euros to, to uh, delay it for two weeks. Okay, so from one week to two weeks, the delay you had to be paid 3 euros. If you were promised it in two weeks, then how much would you give up to get it in only one week? And the difference there was only one euro. And again, in a consistent standard preference theory, these things uh, should be the same. This is a kind of frame, framing thing. Uh, so really a, an interesting economist, uh, philosopher, Ariel Rubenstein, who's, he writes about hyperbolic discount. This is where I'm going to sort of get into more esoteric stuff about this. But uh, he argues that the same uh, evidence from behavioral experiments to reject uh, straight line discounting can also be uh, used to explain hyperbolic discounting. So he says that hyperbolic discounting is safe because it can be incorporated into the standard economic model. So you could apply this hyperbolic discounting formula, you still come up with the number that will let you rank projects and so on. He thinks the problem is much deeper than that. Uh, people have different discount rates even for different objects. Uh, for example, people discount money different than material goods and experiments and so on. Um, Okay, just uh, again another just uh, sort of an aside, but uh, in the literature in behavioral economics, uh, you see frequently this idea that uh, uh, there's the rational actor model that these anomalies are explained by a, some of their behavior is rational and other kinds are irrational. So this tug of war sometimes you see these words between the reptilian brain and mammalian brain, and it's our job as economists to train the people to think rationally. Uh, like mammals and not like reptiles. You know, teach people to think like an economist. Uh, again, the implication is that humans try to act rationally, but the, they're sometimes dragged down by their animal instincts. Not economists, of course. Okay, but the view of the neuroscientists uh, take is that the brain is really a single uh, decision-making unit, and you need both parts of the brain. It's really a unified whole. And actually, people with damage to the emotional parts of their brains are incapable of making a decision. So they, they can understand the choices, you can explain them, uh, you know, what, they know what choices they do, but they can't make a decision because they're, they're somehow not engaged in the decision-making uh, process. So people with uh, damage to their uh, emotional parts of their brain are really, you know, they really don't make decisions like a human being. So this, this one example, again, this is not, a, people don't really do these experiments, but uh, suppose that, uh, you know, you're walking along with your two children and the maniac comes up and says, okay, give me one of the children to kill or else I'm going to kill all three. I mean, most of us would have had a hard time making that decision, right? As a matter of fact, you probably would just say, okay, you know, kill us all and I don't have to live with that the rest of my life. But people with damage to the emotional side of the brain, they make the rational decision. Okay, take that one. <laughs> okay, this is uh, the, the famous or infamous uh, discounting equation, sometimes called the Ramsey-Fisher equation. And it, it's really interesting that uh, that simple equation embodies most of the important issues uh, surrounding actually not only discounting, but how we should value the future. And I think, how many people have seen this? Probably, okay, probably yeah, at least at least half. Uh, so R is the social discount rate. That's the, the rate that's applied to things like climate change and the Nordhaus climate change studies, the Stern Review, and so on. That first term alpha is called pure time preference. And that really embodies the responsibility we have for future generations. So you know, to put it bluntly, is the life of someone born 10 years from now worth less than the life of someone born today. I, th I think there's a pretty much a consensus among environmental economists that that should be near zero. It's kind of the ethical thing to do. Irving Fisher said it should be uh, near zero, Samuelson, uh, a lot of other people. And that's actually, in the Stern review, it was like uh, 0 0.01. There's a small probability that a meteor might hit the Earth or some plague that would wipe out the human species, so we don't have to worry about the future. But consider uh, that to be uh, zero. The uh, letter eta or n is the elasticity of utility from consumption, and it really has to be considered with that term g, which is uh, the growth rate uh, of per capita income in the future. Uh, okay, if that if that is value, if its value is one, and because g is really a percent change, then it, it has on the face of a very egalitarian interpretation. 
a 10% loss of income for someone making, say, $10,000 a year, a $1,000 loss would count the same as a person make, making $100,000 a year learning ten, uh, losing $10,000. But when it's applied to climate change, it's actually the opposite, because you project the G and people in 2100 will be you know, many times richer. So uh, if they're 10 times richer, then a $10,000 loss to them uh, we would pay today no more than $1,000. So again, and there's there's other worse things too. One implication of it is that uh, you, for current generations, the redistribution of income from rich countries to poor countries would improve global social welfare. You can't have that, so there's a little factor called a Nagishi weight that they put in to freeze the existing income. Anyway, all these things are hidden in these climate change models. Uh, Okay, so the discount rate really drives uh, policy recommendations. Uh, the difference between the, the only difference really between the Nordhaus and the Stern model was the, uh, the discount rate and, and especially the, what they counted for pure time programs. Stern used a rate of near zero, uh, Nordhaus used a rate of uh, something like one and a half percent. So the, the social discount rate in the Nordhaus model was three percent and the Stern model was something like 1.4 percent. And this was enough to really change the results from having pretty uh, substantial immediate action to do something about climate change versus uh, you know, delaying action. So again, you have all these uh, you know, reams and reams of pages with mathematical equations and derivations. The only thing that matters is the choice of the discount. Okay, so if, uh, if that first term is zero and n is equal to one, then the discount rate is determined uh, by the choice of, uh, of G. So uh, the interesting thing is that, that makes R not really about discounting, but how uh, well off future generations should be. And it opens up, again, a whole bunch of ethical and sort of a, uh, you know, biophysical questions about what the future will look like. You know, more broadly, how well will future generations be able to deal with the problems that we're creating from? Again, if you just look at money, you get a standard economist study not many would even argue this, but standard economists might argue that, okay, if they have more income, if they have five times the income, then they'll have the money to deal with whatever problems we caused uh, with biodiversity.